Hello there ladies and gentlemen, TX141 here, also known as Paul, bringing you another pair of Ace in the Day gameplays for the Arcade Mode of War Thunder. In today's episode, I shall be reviewing the Dornier 217J1. To provide you with a brief historical overview of the Dornier 217 and the variant depicted here in War Thunder, we must go back to 1937, and following on from the success of the Dornier 17 bomber and reconnaissance aircraft, Dornier Verka proposed the Dornier 217 as their response to Luftwaffe's call for a longer range, heavier and more versatile aircraft, being able to carry heavier loads to be delivered via level or dive bombing runs. As a result, the Dornier 217 started life as a heavy bomber, having only external similarities in the form of its design to the previous Dornier 17. The first prototype, 217V1, flew for the first time as of August 1938 to a very poor review. The plane had a tendency to swing upon takeoff, had poor directional stability and rather sluggish controls. And unfortunately this first prototype was to be totaled as of September 1938, with a crash which killed both its pilot and its onboard mechanic. Nonetheless the development continued and with eight more prototypes, by the end of autumn 1939 it was soon realised that the dive bombing component would have to be dropped for the design to progress any further. Additionally it was soon found that a pair of BMW 801 radio engines would have to be mounted for the plane to see any form of production life. Therefore it was only following the 10th prototype as of January 1940 and its test flights which were rather successful by comparison with its predecessors that the first production variant, Dornier 217E1 would be rolled off into combat capable hands by the end of 1940. The E-1 was to be a level bomber which could also double up as an anti-shipping attacker. And so, following on from the start of 1941 all the way through to the end of 1944, the Dornier 217 was to see a number of variants and roles predominantly on the Western Front, yet it never quite had the success that it was perhaps expected to have. And one of the main variants which are of importance is the Dornier 217J1, which we see here in War Thunder. And it's really more of a derivative than a whole new variant, being a derivative of the Dornier 217E2, as we're about to explain. During the course of 1941, and especially at the start of 1942, the British RAF stepped up its night campaign against German-occupied Europe. The bombing raids, especially with the arrival of the first Avro Lancaster bombing raids as of the night of March the 10th to the 11th of 1942, meant that the German Luftwaffe had to equip itself with a much more capable night fighter. The Luftwaffe already had the Junkers 88 C6B, a very capable night fighter but in very low quantities, and so their only other alternative was the Messerschmitt 110 C4, which could not live up to the expectations that it was beset. As a result, Dornier had a degree of foresight, and in March 1941 began work on converting the Dornier 217E platform into that of a night fighter. Of course this meant that the E2 platform would be converted into the J1 by switching out the nose cone for one that could mount four 7.92mm MG17 machine guns along with four 20mm MG FFM cannons. This first derivative was rolled out into combat service by the end of 1941 and by the start of 1942, the Dornier 217J1 was rolled off the assembly line in larger quantities. Additionally, the engines were the same as in the E2, a pair of BMW 801 ML radial engines providing 1380 horsepower. The plane had very poor reviews however when it was rolled off into full combat service by the spring of 1942. It lacked manoeuvrability, a decent top speed, and it had no intercept radar, making night fighting very difficult. Additionally, the plane was uncomfortable to fly due to its high wing loading. All these problems meant that by the summer of 1942, the plane was rolled into a trainer role as the J2 variant came into production. And so with that being said, how exactly does the Dornier 217J1 handle in War Thunder? Well, if we have anything to go by before I extend this review into its full depth, 
it's already taken us the space of roughly 4 minutes and 40 seconds to get up to an altitude of 4,600 metres from approximately 2,500 metres, and that does not bode well for this review. The first game we have here is on the ground strike map Two Towns, and we are using the following setup as we gradually make our way over to intercept an I-153 chasing a friendly SM-79. I'm using stealth ammunition for the machine guns, air target ammunition for the 20mm cannons, and these are the guns in the nose I'm referring to firstly. The reason for this combination is that the stealth rounds comprise of a good mixture of armour piercing and incendiary rounds to penetrate enemy fuel tanks and set them on fire, if you're lucky, or if you aim your shots well. And additionally I'm using the air target belt because that comprises of a huge variety of high explosive and fragmentation incendiary rounds which are absolutely deadly if instant on target. Now, as I break round to the back of this I-153 that is absolutely intent on chasing down our SM-79, we quickly managed to achieve our first kill, but that was more due to the negligence of the enemy player rather than our own skill in this aircraft, and so we continue describing our setup. For the two 13mm MG-131 machine gun turrets, one on top and one underneath, we're using the armour piercing round belt, simply because, much like our review of the ME-410A1, I personally feel that the armour piercing rounds have got a much greater chance of doing damage to critical com sorry, critical components such as engines rather than just essentially spraying and hitting a target and hoping for some damage in the form of setting a fuel tank on fire. I'm also using the 500m gun convergence simply because all the guns are mounted ventrally or in the nose and as a result this is standard to any setup I have on a fighter with the armament in the nose or ventral mounted. And finally we are using a 45 minute fuel load the lowest that we can equip which will allow us to get to the end of the game. And so we can see that up at 5000 meters now we are well above all the action. And really at this point I could say to you that this is where the plane belongs and it truly does. At around 4000 to 5000 meters altitude you will find that the Dornier 217J1 handles quite pleasantly. It does not handle in the same fashion as say an ME410A1 or a Bowfighter Mark VI. They are far more nimble and deft by comparison with this aircraft because you are flying essentially a very quickly converted bomber rather than a dedicated night fighter or heavy fighter and you will feel this all the way through flying this plane whether stock or in fully upgraded condition. Now here we see an enemy Wellington that has come fresh out of spawn and I do not intend to take them out simply because I feel it would be unfair. Instead I opt for the A6M3 just below the Wellington that is climbing up has had ample time to come out of spawn and wants to essentially pursue our friendly Cal I-45 as noted by their fire. So I gradually make my way down and take them out accordingly for our second kill. As we can see we dropped roughly 2000 meters altitude and built our speed up to 660 km an hour, breaking off our throttle at a key moment in order to avoid an overspeed. We break onto the back here of the Wellington bomber which is being ignored by our Cal I-45 and we kill the rear gunner. We do a little bit more damage with our 20mm cannons and we eventually achieve a critical before taking the Wellington completely out. As we can see here the Wellington has been a little bit clever in their evasion manoeuvres and it takes us a good portion of our 800 cannon rounds in order to take them out. With our third kill in the bag we now have to come onto why I had to cut my throttle during that dive. This plane in its overall performance capabilities suffers incredibly at a speed of 475km an hour plus. The roll rate whilst rather poor to begin with, locks up entirely by the time you hit 650 km an hour and by 475 you are already feeling this to an immense respect. Fortunately for us we have enough speed here to come up underneath a Heinkel 111H. As we can see we only have to tap them with our 20mm cannons to achieve our fourth kill. At this point we see an enemy Spitfire from the distance coming directly towards myself and our friendly Kai 45 Otsu Toru. And I believe here that really the only way I'm going to be able to deal with this Spitfire before they can get onto the back of me is if I support my teammate and try and force the Spitfire into a pair of deadly head-ons. Remember we have a completely nose mounted armament here and we are going to put it to good use. The KR-45 is very swiftly taken out as we spray into the Spitfire Mark IIb they spray back at us with their 20mm cannons and 7.7mm machine guns. Fortunately for us we only take a large portion of damage to our main fuselage and nowhere else. Meanwhile the Spitfire Mark IIb suffers critical engine damage and this means as they break up to try and loop over us we can break away. It's as we're about to see in our dive in order to break away from the Spitfire we completely screw up this Parson and I-16 Type 27 
only getting the very bare minimum of our initial burst onto the target in the form of our 7.92mm machine gun rounds, which are not going to be enough on a good day to break a hole in the I-16's tail section. So, as we level out, we see that we're roughly 2,300 meters altitude and our speed is already gradually descending. The Spitfire, fortunately for us, due to their engine damage, cannot keep up, although if the Spitfire was in fully ready condition right now, it would be game over for us, unless we turn to face them head on once again, simply because it is very difficult to outrun anything at your battle rate in a 3.3, bar of course bombers such as the BBY, the B-25 Mitchell and the Wellington Mark I although these planes actually have comparable top speeds to your own. To give you an example, I believe the B-25 Mitchell has a top speed rated in arcade mode of 444 km an hour, compared to the Dornier 217J1's 511 km an hour. If we put this in a comparison with the Bowfighter Mark VI, 542 km an hour, you can already see you've got a major speed differential to have to make up for. And so as we level out and we're in the clear, rather close to the enemy airfield at 2,700 meters altitude, we begin to just break away. At first I'm thinking to myself, well, I should really chase down that enemy PBY. But as I've looked behind myself, I've seen a B-25 Mitchell come straight out of spawn. And the one thing I do not want is for that B-25 Mitchell to begin to chase after me, because it will be a dogfight between essentially two bombers. Or one bomber and a derivative of a bomber. Fortunately for myself, the B-25 actually decides to fly level and dive on the ships when I've turned around. And so really here I'm preying on the negligence of my opponent, rather than my own versatility or skill per se. We achieve a kill assist on that Spitfire from earlier, and as the B-25 dives we decide to fly level and assess the situation. We see that there are no enemy fighters close by, but the B-25 will have the speed advantage on us if we go into a dive. And so we look at the enemy P3 and the B25 once again and realise that they are both after probably the same target, the ships. And we can intercept them both accordingly, the P3 on the way in and the B25 on the way out. So as we can see here, as we go into a near vertical dive, we struggle to build up our speed. But to remain control, sorry, remain in control, I need to cut my engine and then bring it back in once I hit a speed of roughly 600 km an hour. Here the P3 makes a slight adjustment to their flight path and I have to line up a second burst, which right at the end of it, the 20mm cannon rounds do their job. And so if you can get your shots onto target as depicted there, you can achieve your kills incredibly quickly, but it's getting the shot on target and getting that lead on target, which is the very difficult part. And with already our ace in the bag, I'm starting to fly away, as I see an enemy bow fighter coming in, and at rather high speed. Yet I know here if the bow fighter comes after me, I will not be able to get away because it is a much faster plane with greater acceleration. So I go for a head on, weaving around a little bit in order to try to avoid taking any significant damage. Fortunately for myself, the bow fighter decides to hold fire until a very late moment by comparison with myself when I fired at a long distance from roughly one kilometer away. And this allowed us to achieve our sixth kill and the final one for this gameplay. So as we can see already, now that we're down at 6,000 meters altitude, all our performance has worn off. We started off at a very high altitude and we've had to descend. And once again we have to descend our altitude one last time to try and break away from the enemy P-40, which fortunately for us is being chased by a friendly Yak-1. Otherwise it would have been very difficult, I personally feel, to get away from that P-40 Kitty Hawk. And so with that being said, let's just take a look at some post-game stats. Hence, we can see our 6 kills, single assist, and times 2 bonus for the first victory of the day allowed us to earn 19,035 silver lines. On top of this, we earned 2,700 research points, with 807 going towards our research on the Heinkel 162A2. We thereby conclude this portion of our Dornier 217J1 review by realising that if you are on a map which gives you the space to do so, this plane can gradually climb up to its intended altitude range of 4,000 to 5,000 metres altitude. And once up there, so long as it has the support of friendly fighters or just the complete vacancy of any enemy interceptors, this plane makes for a brilliant bomber hunter. Thanks to its quad 20mm MGFFM cannon layout, it will be very easy to dispatch any of the targets you can experience at your battle rating. We also notice that this plane is rather slow, it has a limited top speed and the acceleration is rather poor. 
mean that to chase after bombers it is going to take you some time and effort, especially if you have to do a 180 degree turn to go after them. However, as soon as we switched out our overall bomber hunter role for that of hunting fighters, we noticed that in both the energy and turn circles, this plane can by no means compare to any of the other heavy fighters such as the Messerschmitt 410A1 or any of the fighters which we saw in the video, especially by comparison with say that Spitfire Mark IIb. Instead you will have to go on head to head with most of the opponents in order to cripple them whilst absorbing a good portion of their return fire into your main fuselage as by doing this you may get away unscathed by comparison. And we can see by the comparison with the rest of our team that we came forth because we stuck to the intended role of our plane, albeit taking 4 minutes and 40 seconds to get up to our intended altitude and start to build our speed once again. Yet nonetheless if we had stayed up there and resorted to not going after any of our opponents climbing up at us such as that A6M3, we would have found that we would have been able to intercept say that PBY at the end and really consolidate a high altitude space for friendly bombers. Yet this was all circumstantial as already iterated and we are now going to see the Dornier 217J1 in a gameplay where I get none of this luck, I'm not able to create my own circumstances and I push this plane to its pure limit. We thereby continue our review now of a ground strike game on the map port. Using the same setup as before, I should also point out that my pilot's vitality is 40 and this allows me to stay alive in those deadly head on engagements whereby I have only lost this plane to pilot knockouts twice in all the deaths I have incurred. The rest have been caused due to wings coming off or the tail section being wiped off, usually by larger calibre 37mm shells. Yet I digress, and we start off this game by climbing very severely from 2100 meters altitude to 2750. This is rather uncharacteristic for my playstyle, yet I justify it by the fact that the spawns on the map port are a lot less distant than by comparison on the map two towns, and this philosophy also applies especially to the map Green Ridge. Whilst I could try and fly off to the side and build up my altitude very gradually, it is very likely that while the enemy fighters from spawn will pick up on this and proceed to rip me to pieces, as I will be in a disadvantageous position. So at 2850 meters altitude, I decide to break around, using the full extent of my rather limited rudder, my poor roll rate and my decent elevator, in order to start heading in the other direction and build up my speed and altitude. Yet yeah, already at 2970 meters altitude, an enemy F4U-1A Corsair is about to pursue me, having killed off a P26A, and it is here I'm going to show you how I personally try to deal with tailors. The Corsair can outrun me on the level and it can outrun me in the dive, yet I've got enough distance to dive down into the cloud layer and gain a little bit of what I would call blind distance between myself and my opponent. That is, they will lose sight of me for a limited period of time, and I can use my rather negligible roll rate here yet my powerful elevator and limited rudder use in order to break into a very sharp turn and force the Corsair to overshoot. So at this point I engage my combat flaps, continue with the elevator but try and bring the nose down as much as possible because the rather forward centre of mass of the Dornier 217J1 means that you can turn very tightly at high speed and bring the nose round as well very quickly. And that is what allowed us to come round to the back of that F4U Corsair that tried to break up and away from us in time for us to achieve our first kill with the leading edge of our burst. I've been able to implement this tactic of overshoot and quick turn round up against planes such as the P63A King Cobra and the Messerschmitt Y9 F4. I've not been successful in every encounter, yet I would say 50% of the time this has boded well for me, or it has allowed me to put myself in a situation where my opponent is going to need at least one more full 360 degree turn to come after me, or they have to set up another boom and zoom run at which point I may have a friendly fighter trying to interdict the situation. Moving on from this, I am now in a bit of an impasse. I'm at 2050 meters altitude with a speed of 280 km an hour. If I try and climb above the cloud layer, I could bump into a large portion of enemy fighters. At the same time, if I go below the cloud layer, I lose all of my performance, as we've already pointed out this is a high altitude performer, not made for low altitudes. Yet I decide to go for the safer of the two options, simply because I want to conserve my status as a heavy fighter and try to make the most of the plane as a sort of support function. So I decide to dive down, at this point I switch off the engine as I try to dive after an enemy B-25 Mitchell. Yet our friendly Yak-1, being a very good shot, takes out the Mitchell very quickly, and so I have to break back up here to roughly 1400 meters, right off at the lower edge of the cloud layer. 
and so I am now looking for a train to pursue. And for those who do not know what I mean by a train, essentially a lollygaggle or line of friendly and enemy fighters which can be dispatched very quickly if you break onto the back of it with a superior amount of armament by comparison with most of your foes. And we are about to show this right now. A P-36A Hawk lines himself up off the edge and we quickly dispatch him for our second kill. And at this point, as the enemy Cal 43 Mark I, at the lead of the train, tries to weave in and out and lose a little bit of their energy, they are being pursued by a friendly Yak-1 and Messerschmitt 19E3. These two planes are really doing damage to each other rather than my opponent, and so I decide just to fight intermittent bursts, and as the Hayabusa gets caught on the edge, I go for my third kill. Now if you apply this philosophy, especially on airfield domination matches, you can find that you rack up sometimes up to 5 kills in very quick succession. Of course, the risk is that an enemy plane will get onto your tail, and so you have to make sure you maintain full awareness at all points, looking at both your radar and looking around yourself 360 degrees, as tunnel visioning will get you killed. Nonetheless, as we level out here, we can see that the oil in our engines is already overheating, and this is because we are flying at lower altitudes than intended for this aircraft. I found that the engines overheat very quickly the lower you go. Whilst this may not be historically accurate, it's just something I've picked up on in the game. And so as we try to build up our altitude here, we see that there is an enemy friendly furball at roughly 2.5 to 3 kilometers away, and it is in a rather contested state. So I decide here to go for a very sharp climb and gradually use my rather weak rudder to break myself around. The reason being, now with an extra 200 meters altitude, I can instantly go into a dive if anyone comes directly for me, or attack them head on having a slight altitude advantage and therefore the initiative. And so at an altitude of 875 meters I level out and try to build up my speed. I am once again looking for a target to pursue when I dive down. Unfortunately this time nobody forms up a nice long train, but an enemy Yak-1 here decides to take down while our friendly aircraft and levels themselves out for a naval head on. Fortunately for myself I do not hit the friendly plane and very shortly the Yak-1 breaks around and lines himself up for my fourth kill. Again, we apply the fact that the Yak-1 was rather oblivious to our existence, and now I make a major mistake. An I-16 Type 18 Ishak comes right onto the back of us and cuts their engine. If the Type 18 Ishak had rockets mounted here, it would have been game over. At this point I am depicting the fact that whilst this plane has a terrible climb rate, the fact that you have two engines means that you can keep climbing into that stall space for a very extended period of time. As we can see here, the I-16 Type 18 Ishak is having trouble lining themselves up perfectly on the back of us, and the rather irritating 13mm gun on top means that we managed to take out the engine of the Ishak, and this is the first time I've actually done any critical damage to an enemy plane thanks to a rear gunner, whether manually mounted or AI controlled. And so here as we use the rudder to break ourselves around, and the rather mediocre roll rate at low speed in order to break ourselves away into a small dive, the I-16 once again tries to give pursuit, but very shortly breaks off due to the fact that their engine is dying out. An enemy MC-200, as far as I recall, comes onto the back of us but soon breaks off after a friendly lag free, with two more friendly fighters in tow. And so here I decide to break around once again, and opt for a possible head on where appropriate. So because I've crippled off an I-16, and there are quite a number of friendly fighters here to try and attract the attention of most of my opponents. We see an F-4F Wildcat pursuing a lag free, although over braking on them, or flying above them. And so as the F4F comes around for another turn, and leading right into the form of our guns, we notice that we may be able to give pursuit here, simply because the F4F has now gone after one of our ships, and as they break up they're going to lose a good portion of their energy, meaning that 341 kilometers an hour we may be able to catch them. We swiftly do so, although be aware that I'm not giving them sufficient lead here, because the lower the low mus muzzle velocity of the 20mm cannons means that it's very difficult to get sufficient lead onto target at longer distances. We achieve our ace nonetheless, killing off that F4F Wildcat, and we can see here that we are really utilising the plane at the completely wrong altitudes and the completely wrong condition. And so I have an enemy lag free coming in, at this point I decide to break and try to go head on with the lag free, so because I have the feeling that this is my only chance. Fortunately for myself I managed to dodge the entire lead of their fire, because I break underneath them as the lag 311 comes around, they position themselves right in front of our burst. Fortunately we do not provide sufficient lead in order to take them out, but that is another tactic which works very well. At a low speed you may be able to break underneath your opponents and force them right in front of your gunfire. 
At the same time as the Lag 311 comes around once again, the 20mm cannon rings true, but it does not do enough damage to our main fuselage. We're once again employing the rather good durability of our plane to stay alive for a very long period of time. The Lag 311 gets off another very limited burst, and we have to break round into a loop at this point, simply because we do not have the energy to swing round and try and get in behind the Lag 311. However, now that we have built up our energy once again, we force them to come around one last time. As we break round on the rudder, we realise that actually they're flying for lower altitude and trying to build up their speed. They have lost track of us temporarily, and now they are coming around for a head-on, at which point we can respond in kind with our sixth kill, dodging one of their rockets as well. And so at this point we have seen just how limited the Dornier 217J1 is in the midst of a furball or really at lower altitudes. As I try to ward off this Junkers 87R2 for my 7th kill, I realise that my attempt is rather futile. The Junkers 87R2 at their dive speed is able to outmanoeuvre me quite quickly, and so I decide just to break off and build up my speed, especially with an extenuating fuel leak from my left fuel tank in the wing. At this point I'm continually looking behind me trying to build up some speed and try to reconsolidate any position I have in terms of energy, although this is incredibly difficult as already highlighted multiple times. Nonetheless, if we recap the overall series of dogfights we've just had, in a rather low altitude, low speed engagement, we've noticed that due to the two BMW engines mounted in the wings, you can continue to temporarily climb before stalling out for a longer period of time than, say, an enemy opponent, such as we saw that IS-16. Additionally, the fact that you can bleed off your speed quite effectively, and if I was to cut my engine I would have done so even quicker, means that a lot of the time your opponents are going to find it incredibly hard to stay behind you in given circumstances. We noted that with the Lag 311, because we were travelling so slow and we cut underneath them, dodging all of their incoming fire, we managed to actually force them to come right into our line of fire. It's unfortunately for us we just didn't time our shots in time. And as I pointed out earlier, the muzzle velocity of the 20mm cans is rather low, and you will find that at roughly half a kilometre or more, you will have to not only give a little bit extra lead, you will also have to provide a little bit of vertical lead in order to get your shots onto target as probably noted in a number of the shots I've taken during the course of this game. Nonetheless, once you get those shots onto target, you can rip anything in your way to pieces, and we're now about to display that against an A20G Havoc, which at first I tried to dive away from because I believe they are coming after me with their 650 calibre machine guns, and I soon realised that actually they are prioritising the friendly ships, and so this is another opportunity for a kill. I also look up at an enemy SU-2, because sometimes SU-2s prove themselves to be quite deadly bomber and heavy fighter hunters. I break up and over, trying to come around on the A20G Havoc, using once again my durable frame to soak up some 50 caliber fire, and here I manage to make my 7th kill, quickly dispatching a rather armoured and well defended foe. Therefore with 7 kills in the bag I, res I resort to my overall tactic of breaking away and trying to build up my altitude and speed, because while we're at lower altitudes, if we have the window to do so, we may as well try and consolidate whatever we have left of our position. And really at this point, if I have to give you an idea of my mindset, I'm just praying for the game to end. I've pushed this plane well beyond its capabilities, using its durability and forcing myself into some rather silly, tricky and deadly situations. As I break around here again, I'm actually using the nose heavy nature of the plane to make my turn circle a little bit tighter. And this is one bit of advice, especially when going up against enemy heavy fighters, such as the Bow Fighter Mark VI, the ME410 and the Kai 45 Toru. Whilst you will not be able to outturn any of these planes in my opinion and from my experience, you will be able to use your nose heavy nature to perhaps cut inside their turn circles and force an overshoot. And as we saw against that Corsair earlier on, and as I've experienced a number of other personal examples, if you can do this, sometimes you can grab a kill off a much more manoeuvrable foe, simply because you can take them by surprise and utilise one of the hidden features of this aircraft, which when combined with that rather poor rudder and rather powerful elevator response, especially with speed, you can find that actually you can position yourself quite nicely. And as we level out once again at roughly 590 meters altitude, I decided at this point to try and pursue the SU-2, simply because all they needed to do was drop one or two more bombs on our friendly mini base, as depicted at the front of your screen here, in order to win the game for the enemy team. Yet as I gradually build my speed up, we can see here that by comparison when flying at 4000 meters altitude, our acceleration is abysmal. And as the SU-2 rather casually glides along to drop their last couple of bombs, we can see even when we go into a rather sharp climb, we just have not got the performance to get onto the back of the SU-2 or shoot their out underneath. And so, 
we lose the game for our friendly team, and that was all on us really. Nonetheless, with that being said, let us take a look at some more post-game stats. Hence, from the second game we can see our 7 kills and single assist allowed us to net 17,942 silver lines. On top of this we had 981 research points, with 294, once more, going towards our research on the Heinkel 162. We thereby conclude our review of the Dornier 217J1 by this more realistic approximation of your experience with the plane. You will find it, for the most part, very difficult to get up to that 4000 to 5000 meter altitude sweet spot and therefore you will not be able to engage the enemy bombers unless they dive down towards lower altitudes. When you do get an enemy tailor in a much more nimble and quicker plane than yourself, diving into a cloud layer or just going into a general dive can actually save your life. Once you hit about 600 kilos an hour, you will find that your roll rate becomes negligible, yet your elevator becomes more powerful and your rather poor rudder stays with you. Meaning that if you can force the plane round into a nose heavy turn, you will be able to break very tight and therefore cause some of your opponents, including but not limited to an F4U Corsair and a P-39 Aerocobra to overshoot and plant themselves right in the face of your 20mm cannons, meaning that you can dispatch them for some rather quick and pleasant kills. Additionally, you should also note that the durability of the main fuselage can be abused, and we abused it significantly when going up against the Lag 311 and more prominently that I-16 Type 18. Although be aware if your opponent is armed with rockets or a 37mm cannon, they can rip you to pieces very quickly. We can see by comparison the rest of our team that we came fifth. Not because we utilised the plane in its most effective fashion, but because we stuck with it, broke in and out of the furball where possible, and used opportunities such as breaking up onto that small train to pick off two enemy fighters which were being pursued by a large portion of rather inaccurate friendlies. And so really, you make the most out of the Dornier 217J1 by the opportunities you visualise down at lower altitudes. Although be aware, when flying below 2000 meters altitude in particular, your performance degrades horrifically. As we saw that last ditch attempt on attacking that SU-2, your climb rate, your acceleration and your overall performance decays so quickly. Nonetheless, what is also important to realise that to beat the Dornier 217J1, you can either use a plane such as the Focke Wulf 90 a 4 to dive with the Dornier, so because that plane maintains its roll rate and it has the absolutely lethal burst mass of 420mm cannons, or you just need to simply break out wide every time the Dornier tries to make a manoeuvre, meaning that you can stay behind it, dispatch the gunners and rip the wings off or cut the fuselage in two at the tail section. Nonetheless, if you're looking for a heavy fighter, which is a brilliant bomber hunter but can also take a good portion of its more nimble opponents by surprise by utilising its turtle-like nature down at lower altitudes to force them to overshoot or stall out right behind you in the face of your 13mm machine gunner turret, the Dornier 217J1 is the heavy fighter for you. And so I've been TX141, and if you've enjoyed this video why not leave a like, comment or subscribe for future War Thunder videos on my channel. Yet until next time ladies and gentlemen, take care and good luck in the skies.